In this video, I'm going to talk about how to make a circuit that generates a sine wave at a frequency of 60 hertz. So here's an overview of what you need to do. Step one is to use the 555 timer to generate a square wave at 60 hertz. The 555 timer is very useful for generating low frequency signals. Now the second step is to convert the square wave into a sine wave. And one way you can do this is by using an LC network, a network that contains an inductor and a capacitor in this configuration. So L is a symbol for the inductor, C is for the capacitor. And then at the output, if you choose the appropriate values of L and C, you can get a sine wave. Now the formula that you could use to help you get those values is this equation. The resonant frequency of the LC network is 1 over 2 pi square root LC. Now you want the frequency of the timer to match the resonant frequency of the LC network. When that happens, the square wave will be converted into a sine wave. Now, I've actually tested this circuit with a square wave at a frequency of 264 hertz. To calculate the capacitance that I needed using a certain inductor, I had to rearrange the formula. So the inductance that I use was a 100 millihenry inductor, but when I measured it with my multimeter, it turned out to be 96.7 millihenries. Now, rearranging this equation to give me the capacitance that I need, you can get this formula. C is 1 over 4 pi squared, that's a terrible looking 2, times F squared times L. So once you square both sides of this equation and then rearrange it to solve for C, you're going to get this equation here. So 1 over 4 pi squared squared times 264 squared times an inductance value of 96.7 millihenry. So milli is 10 to the minus 3. So if you type this in, you should get 3.76 times 10 to the minus 6 farads. 10 to the minus 6 is equal to micro. So this is the same as 3.76 microfarads. Now to get a 3.76 microfarad capacitor, what I had to do was I had to combine two capacitors in parallel to each other. So the first one that I used was a 3.3 microfarad capacitor, and the second one was a 0.47 microfarad capacitor, giving me a total capacitance of approximately 3.77, which is close to 3.76. And at the output, when I tested it with my multimeter, the square wave was converted into a sine wave. Now, I tested out the same circuit with a lower frequency, that is a frequency that's close to 60 hertz. It was about 60.3, and my 555 timer didn't give me a perfect square wave. The wave that I got looks something like this. The inductance that I had to use was a 288 millihenry inductor, basically three 100 millihenry inductors combined in series. And 
the capacitance that I needed to make it work was a 10 microfarad capacitor. And this was set to approximately 60 hertz. Now at this capacitance value, I did get a sine wave. It wasn't perfect, but for the most part, it was mostly a sine wave. Now when calculating the capacitance I, I needed using this frequency, the actual value was different than what I have here. So let's go ahead and plug this in. So 1 over 4 pi squared times 60 squared times 288 times 10 to the minus 3. So the theoretical capacitance that I needed was 2.44 times 10 to the minus 5 farads. If you divide that by 10 to the minus 6, this is equivalent to a 24.4 microfarad capacitor. So this is the theoretical value that I needed in order to convert this wave into a sine wave. But in practice, a 10 microfarad capacitor worked very well. So you can use this formula to help you get an idea of the value of the capacitance that you need in order for this circuit to work and then adjust it accordingly using your oscilloscope. Now, the deviation might be due to many reasons. It could be due to the fact that the incoming wave is not a pure square wave. It could be due to the fact of I have other capacitors in my 505 timer circuit, or it could be affected by the mutual inductance between the three inductors that I have in series. So it could be a combination of any of those factors that can cause this deviation. But nevertheless, you could still use this formula to give you an idea of what capacitor you need to use and then just adjust it accordingly based on what you see on your oscilloscope. Now let's put this all together. So the first thing that we need to write up is the 555 timer circuit. Let me draw a bigger box. So this is pin 7, is connected between RA and RB. RB is attached to pin number 2 and also attached to pin 6. Pin 2 is connected to a capacitor and that goes to ground. We'll call this C1. Pin 3 is the output pin. 1 goes to ground. And at pin 3, you want to have the inductor. And then next to that, you want to have a capacitor that goes to ground. So this is L. We'll call this C2. So L is set to 288 millihenries. C2 is set to 10 microfarads. Next, we have pin 8, which goes to a 9-volt battery. And also pin 4 is connected to it as well. RA is set to 2.2 kilo ohms. RB, for this I use a potential meter, so you can adjust the duty cycle of the square wave that comes out of pin 3. So at pin 3, if you want to create another output, you'll get a square wave there, if the frequency is high enough. If it's at 60, what I got is a wave that looked like this. So it wasn't a nice, perfect square wave. C1 in my experiment is set to one microfarad and RB is a 50 kilo ohm potential meter. But now for this experiment to work, I have it set to 12.2 K. 
So when I got a 60 hertz uh, output sine wave, this was measured to be 12.2K, but you can vary it from 0 to 50K to adjust the duty cycle. You want a duty cycle of 50%. That is, for your square wave, you want it to be 50% above the x-axis and 50% below the x-axis. Now, the duty cycle can be calculated using this formula. It's RA plus RB divided by RA plus 2RB times 100%. Now, one of the simplest waves, let me say that again. One of, blah, my voice is just not working today. But one of the most simplest ways to achieve a duty cycle of 50% is to make sure that RB is significantly greater than RA. When that happens, if RB is much larger than RA, these two terms become negligible. So you get 1RB over 2RB, and it becomes approximately 50%. 1 over 2 is 1 half. So let's do the math for the numbers that I have in this video. So RA is set to 2.2K. Since the units are the same, we don't have to plug it into the formula. RB is 12.2. So 2.2 plus 12.2, that's 14.4. 2 times 12.2, that's 24.4 plus 2.2. So that's 26.6. And so this is 54.1%. It's not exactly 50%, but to make this experiment work, this is good enough. So that's, what I, that's why I have RB as a potential meter, to not only adjust the duty cycle of the square wave that's generated at output 3 or pin 3, but also to adjust the frequency as well. RB greatly affects the frequency of the circuit. And to calculate the frequency, you could use this formula. It's 1.44 over RA plus 2RB times C1. So using the values that I have in this circuit, RA is 2.2 kilo ohms. This time we need to convert it to ohms. So that's 2200 plus 2RB. That's 12,200 times 2, so that's 24,200, and then times C1, which is a 1 microfarad capacitor. So that's 1 times 10 to the minus 6. You may, you may want to put all of that in parentheses. So if you plug this all in, if you do it correctly, you should get a frequency of 54.5 hertz, which is close to the 60 hertz signal that I got in this circuit. Now, I do want to say that this circuit is not complete yet. So far, we have most of the pieces on the board, but there are some other pieces that I've added to the circuit. And this is how you can change the frequency from 54 to 60 is by turning this pulse generator circuit into a voltage control oscillator circuit. And to do that, you need to use pin number five. So attached to pin four is another potential meter, which goes to ground. And then connected to that is pin five. Now, I wanna say that RB for that potential meter, I'm only using two of the three pins. A typical potential meter, let me draw it differently, has three pins. For RB, I'm using the middle pin and one pin at the end. Now for this resistor, which we'll call R1, I'm using all three pins. Pin five is the pin at the middle. One of the other pins goes to ground, and the other one goes to the 9-volt supply. 
So for R1, I've used a 100 kilo ohm potential meter. So between pin 5 and ground, the measured resistance was 45.2 kilo ohms. And between pin 5 and positive 9V, the resistance measured was 55.8 kilo ohms. The total resistance is still 100. So it was set to those settings when I got a, a frequency of 60 hertz. So these two potential meters will affect the frequency of the circuit. RB greatly affects the frequency. As you tune it, the frequency will change widely. But R1 is used for fine tuning. The frequency doesn't change that much when you adjust R1. So to get to 60 hertz, first adjust RB. When you get close to it, let's say like 58, 63, then you want to use R1 to fine tune the circuit to 60 hertz. So remember, R1 is used for fine tuning. RB is used for general tuning. And if you want to create a sine wave with a higher frequency, keep in mind, not only can you adjust RB, but you can also use a different C1 value. For instance, if you decrease the value of C1 from 1 microfarad to 0.1 microfarad, the frequency will increase by a factor of 10 from 60 hertz to 600 hertz. So C1 will have a direct impact on the frequency of the circuit based on this formula. As you can see, C1 is on the bottom of the formula. So as you increase C1, the frequency decreases. Likewise, if you decrease C1, the frequency goes up. Or if you decrease RB or even RA, the frequency will also go up. So you could use a 500 kilo ohm potentiometer instead of a 50 kilo ohm potentiometer. But if you use a higher potentiometer, it's going to be harder to adjust it to 12.2. But nevertheless, you do have some flexibility with this circuit. So that's it. This is the entire circuit uh, that you need if you want to create a 60 hertz sine wave generator. Thanks for watching.